Hi guys! Today we will continue studying Docker. So, as we already know, Docker is the powerful containerization technology to package and run your applications. Docker containers are known for their speed, efficiency and portability. They let you package everything your application needs to run, from code to dependencies, in a neat, isolated container. But what about your application's data? Where does it go when a container is stopped or deleted? This is where Docker volumes come into play. Docker volumes are a feature that addresses the challenge of data persistence in containers. They are like dedicated storage areas that can be attached to one or more containers. Think of them as specialized folders that reside outside the container on the host system. Volumes serve several crucial purposes. One of them – data persistence. Containers are ephemeral, meaning they can be created and destroyed easily. Without volumes, any data generated or modified inside a container would disappear when the container shuts down. Volumes enable you to store data outside the container, making it persistent even when the container is gone. Also, it helps with data sharing. Volumes can be shared among multiple containers. This is incredibly useful in scenarios where you need multiple containers to access and work with the same data. We can use containers for backup and restore. Docker volumes simplify the process of backing up container data. You can create snapshots of volumes, ensuring that your valuable data is safe and can be easily restored in case of accidents or disasters. And finally, database management. Volumes are frequently used with database containers, as databases require persistent storage. With volumes, you can stop, remove or even replace a data container while keeping your data intact. So, let's go to the practice. Docker volume list returns a list of volume names currently existing on the Docker host. You can also use the shortened version of this command. Docker volume ls shows the same. For now, we don't have any volumes. The docker pc command is used to list the currently running Docker containers on your system. We also don't have any running containers at the moment, but command docker pc a shows us all containers, even that were stopped. We have one container from the previous lesson, but today we are not going to use it. The docker images command is used to list the docker images that are currently stored on your local system. I remind you that docker images are essentially templates or blueprints for creating docker containers. For this lesson, I will use the MongoDB image. We will start several containers from this and see how docker volumes work. The docker run command is used to start a new docker container from a specified docker image. Then we set name parameter. This part of command specify the name you want to give to the container. Then minus D. This flag stands for detach mode. It tells Docker to run the container in the background. It allows you to continue using your terminal for other tasks without being attached to the container's console. Then minus P. This option is used for port mapping. It tells Docker to map port 27019 on the host machine to port 27017 inside the container. Port 27017 is commonly used for MongoDB, and this mapping allows you to access the MongoDB service running inside the container from your host machine. And finally, id mongo image. This image will be used to create and run the container. So when you execute this command, Docker will start a new container based on the specified image. We covered this in the previous lesson. Details can be found in the video link above. Now the docker pc command shows our running container. Using mongosh, we connect to the mongodb from the terminal and check the existing databases. What is Mongosh? You can find out in the video link above. But in short, this is the MongoDB shell. With a useMyDB command, we create a new database and immediately switch to it. We create a simple collection in it, so that uh, the database is not empty. Now we have a created database with a collection. 
Next, we use the docker stop command to stop our running container with the created database. Now, when we run the docker pc command, it shows that there are no running containers. The docker pc-a command displays all containers, including the stopped ones, where we can see our container. Our created container exists, but we cannot connect to it. To do that, we use the docker start command to start it again and then connect to the database. I'll show you what I'm doing in a second. Now I connect to the MongoDB again and here we are. We can see our database that we created and nothing was lost. But what about if we delete our container? With the command docker stop, we stop our container and then remove it with the command docker rm. Now the commands docker pc and docker pc minus a show us that our container is gone. With the same command, with the same parameters, we start a new container. Connect to the Mongo and yes, we lost the database. And that's why we should use volumes. Docker provides various types of volumes for storing and managing container data within Docker images. Host volumes allow specific files or directories from the host system to be mounted directly into a container. They enable containers to access files at the host level, and any changes made to these files are immediately reflected in the container and vice versa. It helps when you need a container to access specific files or directories on your host system. They are often used for transferring configuration files or data between the host system and containers. Anonymous volumes are temporary volumes created automatically by Docker to store container data. They are intended for temporary storage for data with no permanent purpose and may be discarded when the container is removed. They are typically used for temporary storage of bulk data such as long or temporary files. Named volumes have a specific name and are designed for long-term data retention. They are not tied to any specific container and can be used across different containers. We usually use them when we need to store data for the long term and provide access to it for multiple containers. So let's create our first named volume. With the command docker volume create, we create volume for the Mongo. We name it Mongo data. And now if we type the command docker volume ls, we can see our named volume and several anonymous volumes. They were left over from the previous containers. After deleting a MongoDB container that was launched without using docker volumes, without explicitly specified volumes. An anonymous volume creating MongoDB data may still remain. Docker retains anonymous volumes after container deletion to preserve temporary data. This is done to provide access to this data in case it is important or valuable even after the container has been deleted. It can be useful for debugging or analyzing logs. If you want to delete these anonymous volumes, you can use the command docker volume rm and name the volume you want to delete. Of course, this volume should not be attached to the currently running container. So I stop and remove the previous container that we launched. The command docker rm and id container will remove it. As we can see, our container is not present in either the running or stopped containers. So now I'm going to delete our two anonymous volumes. And I've done it successfully. So now if we take a look at our list of volumes, we will see only our named volume that we created earlier. I repeat my docker command to start a new docker container, except I add minus minus rm flag. It used in docker containers to automatically remove a container when it stops running. When you run a docker container without the rm flag, the container continues to exist in a stopped state after it completes its task or you manually stop it. It means that you will have to manually clean up the stopped containers using the docker rm command. But with rm flag, I'll show you what will happen. We can see that two anonymous volumes were created. Now I stop this container and look at this. 
our container was immediately removed. It not present in the running or stopped containers. Docker PC minus A shows us only stopped container from the previous lesson. Anonymous volumes were also automatically removed. If you want to delete all volumes at once, you can use the command docker volume prune. This command is used to remove all unused volumes from your docker environment, but I won't be using it now. So right now I have the volume Mongo data, and if I want to retrieve detailed information about this docker volume, I use the command docker volume inspect. When you run this command, you specify the name or ID of the volume that you want to inspect. And Docker provides a JSON formatted output containing various details about that specific volume. Now the most interesting part. Let's launch a container with our named volume. I will list our images to get the ID for starting the container. Then we execute the command. I won't repeat the explanation for this command, but I add a parameter that wasn't there before. Dash dash volume, then specify the name of our volume that we created, and then specify the path where it will be mounted. So in our container there is a data folder, inside which there is a db folder to which we are going to mount. To enter a running container, execute the command docker exec. I parameter it stands for interactive. This option allows you to interact with the command being executed in the container. It connects your terminal to the container's terminal, enabling you to provide input and see the commands output in real time. T parameter it ensures that the command executed inside the container behaves as if it's running in a real terminal. Then the name or ID of the running docker container you want to access. And bash, a commonly used Unix shell, or for Windows it will be cmd. Here we are. In the data folder we see db folder. We connect it to mongodb using the mongodb shell, check the databases, create our database and immediately start using it. So we write some data into it. Create a collection, a very simple one for demonstration purposes. For those who aren't familiar with non-relational databases, let me briefly explain. In a typical relational database, we have tables, while in non-relational databases like MongoDB, we have collections. If we now enter the container and navigate to our DB folder, we will see the information that has appeared there. I'll remind you that we launched this container using a named volume. Now I'll start this container and remove it. Remember that the volume will not disappear, it will remain intact. Then based on the same image I will create a new container and connect the same named volume that we still have. The docker pc command will display our newly launched container. Using the Mongo shell, I will reconnect to MongoDB. And you can see that in the case where we deleted the container with an anonymous volume, all the information, the database and collection disappeared. But in the case of a named volume, everything remained. And we can see our database and the created collection. Of course, we should switch to this database before checking the collection. Here we are, customer collection. While I was experimenting behind the scenes, I created some anonymous volumes. And now I can demonstrate the docker prune command in action. As you can see, after executing this command, all unused and unattached volumes associated with containers will be deleted, leaving only those that we are actively using. We have discussed both anonymous and named volumes. When it comes to host volumes, the command is almost the same as for named volumes, except that we specify the full path to the host system to the file or directory we intend to mount into our container. Host volumes allow specific files or directories from the host system to be mounted directly into a container. Now I want to explore the second method, mounting specific files or folders from the host system directly into a container. 
As you can see, you can mount not only using the volume flag or its shorthand minus V, but there is also another flag called mount. Let's see how it works in practice. First, I created a folder called testdb on my host and it's completely empty. The docker pc command shows our previously running container, which will leave running. And now let's start a new container. The initial part of the command is the same, except instead of minus "-v", we specify the mount flag. Of course, we need to give it a slightly different name for the container. Next, we need to specify the type. For this example, we'll use bint. Then we specify the source from which we want to mount. This can be source or CRC for short. Notice that I'm currently in the project directory, where the folder I want to mount is located. So I specify pwd to represent the path to the current directory. And then I specify the destination, which can be destination dst or target, it's up to you. Now, for this example, let's point out that the port 27019 is already occupied on the host machine due to the previous containers. So I'll use port 27018. I'll misspelling. The command will now show us both of our working containers. If we take a look at our testdb folder, we will see a lot of information in it. And it looks almost identical to if we were using volumes. But there is a difference. When we mount using host volumes, Docker will create the folder for you, if it doesn't exist already. It creates it with the same name you specify and at the location you specify. However, with mount, if you try to mount a folder that doesn't exist, you'll get an error. Let me demonstrate this by creating a third container using the same previous flag, but changing the port to 27020 and specify testdb2 at the folder, which doesn't exist. As you can see, we get an error. So Docker did the work for us when using host volumes by creating the folder if it didn't exist. But with mount, if you are mounting a non-existing folder, you need to create it yourself beforehand. I repeat the same situation with non-existed folder, but instead of mount, I use minus "-v". And we didn't get an error. That's the difference. I hope this clarifies the concept. See you in the next lesson.